welcome everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Robert Baskerville. It's a pleasure for me to, uh, for, for you to join us at tonight's um, presentation of Decipher. Decipher is a monthly variety show which features artists, authors, journalists, and scholars, both of national renown and local origin, to talk about important issues to the black community here in Mount Vernon and throughout the United States, indeed throughout the globe. Um, before we begin, I'd like to extend my thanks to the library as one of the main partners in this venture, along with um, Arch Westchester, that has been very generous in um, providing us with a grant to support this undertaking. And it's an immense pleasure for me to have on stage tonight one of the partners in the Decipher series, um, A.J. Woodson, who is the editor-in-chief of Black Westchester Magazine and also the main host of People Before Politics, the companion um, radio show that appears on Sunday evenings from 6 to 8. Um, Black Westchester, uh, the origin story is something that we're going to discuss, but it's been in existence, I think, for about eight years or so, um, doing a lot of hard-hitting coverage of important issues here in Mount Vernon and throughout Westchester County that often go overlooked. And so we really appreciate um, you guys coming out to join us here because this series does not work, nor does Black Westchester function effectively without the support of the public and we are very thankful for you guys to come out here and join us. We want to say a special thanks to all the young people who yes. gave their time this evening to join us. We know that it can be a sacrifice, and so we appreciate it, and it, it does not go unnoticed. Um, on that note, um, we can, so I will say, everyone, we're starting a little late. You'll forgive us. Uh, this is our sixth show, so we are still working out some of the kinks, including scheduling. So I hope you all understand. We're going to... In, um, out of consideration for the library staff, we're going to try to keep this to a tight hour and 15, uh, 10 minutes or so at most because we got to start packing up about 7.30, 7.40. Um, so we'll have an initial interview with um, myself and AJ, and then we're going to open up the discussion um, to the rest of the audience. As you are well aware, there are copies of AJ's first book, Black Westchester, The Origin Story, and How My Faith Was Instrumental in This Great Experiment, available for sale um, in the following the show for anyone who's interested. Um, and I'm sure you can get it on Amazon also if you want a copy and are not able to purchase it now. So um, without further ado, let's talk with A.J. Woodson. So i got to keep it 100, y'all. A.J. is my man. Um, we work together now in Black uh, Westchester, um, behind the scenes assisting him and um, Damon Jones. And so it is a real honor to have AJ um, on the set with me. Since I've been a part of the um, Black Westchester story for some time now, I'm familiar with many of the challenges that are described in AJ's book on the origins of Black Westchester. And one of the things that I want to note for everyone is two important operative words in the title, faith and also experiment. And so oftentimes when we think about um, endeavors like journalism, um, we don't think about the spiritual dimension that's involved. And I know that's been central um, to the effort that AJ and Damon have put in over um, the past several years, and so I want to start out by asking um, AJ to explain to the audience and to those who may be viewing on the web why faith is such a central dimension in the whole uh, Black Westchester story. Well, we started, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we, started, we started Black Westchester kind of untraditionally, no money, no budget, we just started it. We saw it was a void, something that needed to be done. There wasn't a representation of African Americans in media, and we didn't like the portrayal of African Americans in media, so we decided to cha help change the narrative. Um, without money, um, I stood hard on my faith. I mean, we, we, we started this in June 2014, and a couple, two, three years later, um, we knew we was coming out with a newspaper. 
And I told everybody we're coming out in August. We, we had a local businessman said he was going to give us like three months up front, you know, to put the paper out, and that, that never happened. And I would always say we're coming out in August. Damon was like, my partner, Damon K. Jones, he was like, only if we get the money. I knew we were coming out in August. I didn't know how we were coming out in August. I knew we were coming out in August. I just stood on my faith. Um, I'm very spiritual. Um, I put the work in. I talk about that a little bit in the book. You know, um, people say, you know, they get their part. I can do all things through faith that, you know, um, through Christ, you know, through, with faith. But faith without works is dead. So, like, I put the work in. I found out how to put out a newspaper. I found out, you know, I called everybody. I did everything. I did the work. And basically, by the grace of God, the newspaper came out because, I mean, none of this was possible without God, real talk. So it, I, I speak about, I can't talk about the origin story without talking about how my faith was instrumental in this uh, experiment. There's been plenty of months, literally, when I looked at my bank account, I didn't know how a newspaper was coming out, but the newspaper comes out every month. That a lot of that is through my faith, not just the hard, a lot of hard work, but also because of my faith. So. Now, for many, well, I'll speak. I, I want to say, can I say one yeah. more thing? So, so I dedicate this book to my mom. My mom, as you read the beginning of the book, I was living in Atlanta, and my mother got stage four cancer. Uh, July 11th was an eight year anniversary of her passing. So my mother was a very spiritual woman. And, and I would notice every time um, she would be going through all these things, um, she would always be on her knees, she would always be praying. And when I decided to get more serious about my spirituality, I always looked at my mother as my living example of faith. And what I meant by that, you go to church, they tell you these stories about Abraham and David and all these people. And it's just like being in school when they tell you about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln bunch of white people I never knew. You know what I'm saying? But my mother was my living example of faith. And I saw, I developed my faith from my, mother, my mother's relationship. So I came up here in 2014. I'm probably going to go forward to another question, how we started. We came back up here 2014. I came up here to take care of my mom. Um, like I said, she had stage four cancer. Um, I was in the hospital with her every day. My partner, Damon K. Jones, while I was in Atlanta, we used to have a music company back in the 90s. While, while I was in Atlanta, he became more active. Um, he's in Blacks and Law Enforcement of America. He's an activist. He's, he's a walk-in press conference. He literally has a podium and a microphone and everything in his trunk. He can just pull up and there's a press conference. Right? So he got tired of, like, say, the News 12s and all of them only showing a portion of his press conference and often even missing the meaning and the purpose of the press conference. So he got his own equipment. He saw filming his press conferences and putting them on YouTube. So he asked me to come out this one day. There was these four black parole officers. They went up to Ramapo to, Ramapo to get an escape parolee. Um, he wasn't there on their way out of town. They were pulled over by the local police, and they were held at gunpoint for 45 minutes, despite having bulletproof vests that say NYS, New York State, parole on the front, despite having their badges on, on chains around their neck they were still treated like they were bank robbers or whatever. So nothing was ever done in this press conference was the parole officers about the student department. So I covered the, uh, I videotaped it. Damon probably knew I needed a break from being in the hospital every day, so I, which I did. And um, so he had me come, I videotaped it, and then he sent me the video afterwards and I always had a blog or something. And I basically wrote an article if these four parole officers are not safe, what chance an average brother like me got on the street? And that literally was the birth of Black Questions. So that ended up being like the first article. And then Damien came up with the idea of doing this. Uh, uh, we wanted to do an online news magazine, African-American magazine. We got, you know, you got time, you got life, you got Newsweek, but there was nothing geared towards us. And I had, I've been writing since 93, but for the source, for Vibe, I've been doing all the hip hop stuff. This is the first non-hip-hop, um, the non-entertainment thing I've ever done. But we didn't need another entertainment publication. We got enough of that. So we decided to do an online news magazine, and that's basically how we got started, which is probably the second question you're going to ask me how we got started. <laughs> well, yeah. And I was going to say, so before we, before we continue, and custom ordinarily requires that we acknowledge um, any elected or 
um, appointed officials who have joined us in uh, tonight's audience. And I was mindful as I was looking out. I know that we have many um, officials who are here this evening, and I did want to um, take a moment out to acknowledge them, including starting with the senior most official, um, County Executive George Latimer, who just walked in. Um, Executive Latimer, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here supporting us. I want to I wanna acknowledge um, former Bedford Town Supervisor Mary Ann Carr, who's here. We drove all the way from Bedford to come out here. She's probably, I'm, I'm sure, I think the first African American uh, town supervisor in Bedford, right? The only? Well, is that true? Yes, yes. So definitely welcome her for being here. I um, want to acknowledge uh, Eric Crump and your position escapes me, but I know that you are. <laughs> a sitting official. <laughs> we'll put it like that. Right. And we have Mal Vernon, former Mal Vernon uh, Deputy Clerk Lauren Carter here. So I want to acknowledge that. And, I, and, and not an elected official, I want to acknowledge a brother I just met, Daryl Davis, who drove here from Flatbush, Brooklyn, to cover this because he supports what we do. And I just I definitely want to acknowledge that brother. And one more person I want to give a shout out to that I just met. Um, I, I was inspired. Um, I always say a lot of times, they say the youth is out of control. Oh, Bob Marone just walked in from WVOX and the morning radio morning show. Thank you. I, 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 I always say, I always say they say the youth is out of control. And I always say the reason I'm not dead or in jail like a lot of my classmates is because there were adults who saw something in me. One of them was your brother, uh, Hippo. Uh, we called him Hippo. Um, um, he was a security guard up at Mount Vernon um, a High School. And he was very instrumental in my life. And um, I, I wrote something, which I shared on the radio a lot. Like, I, used to, I was cutting class and everything. I want to tell the story, too. I was cutting class. And he came up to me and rode his bike to my house. He had no need. He had no reason to do it. He came to my house, and he treated me like a man. He had me come outside. My dad was inside. He didn't have this conversation in front of my father. He brought me outside and was like, yo, basically, you're messing up. Only he said it in a lot firmer words, though. And he was like, you need to get your butt back in school, this, that, and the other. And he said, if I'm going to treat you like a man today, but if you don't, the next conversation will include your father. And the respect that he had for me, you know, and that he saw something that I didn't need to be out in the street, and he saw something other, other than that in me, I went back to school the next day, and, and I want to give a shout out, and he just passed, so I'm going to be doing a tribute to him in the next issue to Hippo. Um, he has famous brothers that we know, Ray and Gus Williams, that played basketball, but he's my, he was a superhero in my, in my life, so I just want to acknowledge, and that's his brother right here, so yes, yes, yes. I, before we continue, I also want to take the uh -oh. opportunity to acknowledge Cynthia Turnquest Jones, yes, um, recent Board of uh, Education trustee and a longtime um, affiliate and supporter of Black Rochester, going Abs to absolutely. her both as a writer and also as a co host on People Before Politics. And we have former um, county legislator Ruth Waters that's in the house. Thank you very much for coming. Yes. So anybody else that I didn't acknowledge, thank everybody for being here. So yes, you. we appreciate my, it. My, my, my brother, Noel Brown, uh, thank you. Bob Marone, who has been a big inspiration and uh, was the first person to take a chance and put a microphone in front of me on radio in mm -hmm. Westchester. You can't get it from him. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to him. So, so you know, listen. If I may, the honor is mine, but you've accomplished this amazing. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So for those of us in the room who are a little older and understand the importance of um, perhaps restarting our lives and the challenge that comes with it, um, it's important to note that your, the launching of Black Westchester occurred at a transitional moment in your life that required a tremendous amount of faith. In addition to the passing of your mom, which I know was um, you know, emotionally um, taxing, as many of us would imagine, there were also other ways in which you were remaking your life. And I just wanted to know if you would share, especially those of us 
who may have to, you know, do a midlife change or even are younger, some of the younger people. Um, where does one get the faith to so, totally remake one's life and start essentially a second career? Well, you have, you have to believe in something. Faith has always been very big in my life. Spirituality has always been very big in my life. But this was a whole other thing. Okay, so I used to be a rapper back in the days. I'm dating myself way, way back in the days. For anybody that's mm -hmm. old school hip hop, I was on B-Boy Records when KRS and them dropped South Bronx. So back in 88, I was in a group called JVC Force. We had a record called Strong Island. So first off, so that, you go through this whole thing as a rapper, you're going around the country, people that can't speak English is shouting your lyrics word for word, and it's amazing. And then, you know, that's over and you're kind of like, you go from that, you're torn all over Europe and you come back home and you're kind of like Joe Nobody. So, that, so then I've always been reinventing myself. I, after the, the artist part, I was trying to still stay in the music and then I, be, I was a journalist. So I started up right now for Word Up, Word Up magazine and um, it was somebody's cr crazy idea to have a rapper review other rappers' CDs or something. So that's how I got into it. I started writing for fanzines, then I started writing for The Source and uh, Vibe and Village Voice and several other publications. So then you had that stage of my life, you know, and then, then you know, I, I moved to Atlanta and, and uh, um, got into the, my, I started taking my spirituality a little serious, then I started to think Spiritual Minded Magazine, which was uh, Christian hip hop, you know, reaching out to cats in the street, bringing the Bible to cats in the street who wasn't reading the Bible, who wasn't in anybody's church. So I had that episode. Then I got divorced. Um, my mom's passing. I mean, my mom's sick. She got stage four cancer. I come back up here and I literally, long story short, I lost everything, all my earthly belongings. Like I had literally a knapsack of some clothes and an old laptop. Like that's all I had. And I really, without faith, to even go on, you know what I'm saying? To even just to find some relevance. And, and then when Damon came to me with this idea, I knew we were on to something. I never thought I would be here and we would get you know, national media awards and I got two journalism fellowships. Um, I never thought we would be anywhere near here. Um, shout out to Mark, uh, formerly of Low Hud, who writes for The Post. I uh, just walked in, thank you very much. Um, without all of these things that I went through, my faith, uh, without my faith, I wouldn't have never got through all of these things. And somehow I've been able to reinvent myself and keep going and keep finding a way to be relevant. And that's, that's all God, not me. I can't take credit for that. That's, but you have to believe in something, some kind of power. You have to believe in something bigger than yourself to be able to accomplish anything. So that's, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> one of the themes of the, the book is experimentation. Well, and this this was an experiment. Um, there was no blueprint for this. Shout out to the Westchester County Press. They they've been the only African American voice in the county for ninety years. Um, but they were covering a lot of aspects of our community, but they weren't getting into the the nuts and the bolts of things, the the, the corruption of the politicians and stuff like that. We decided that we were going to do this thing, and it was a great experiment. We made it up as we went along, literally. Like I said, there was no blueprint. Uh, made plenty of mistakes. Never be afraid to make a mistake. I think that's, never be afraid to fail. I think that's the most important thing I can say to the young people. Like, you got an idea, try it. It doesn't work out, try something else. It doesn't work out. I remember reading a quote from Thomas Edison, who's credited with the light bulb. They said he failed 10,000 times before he, um, he created the light bulb. He said he never failed. He just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, just the courage to not be afraid to fail. Nobody took us serious in the beginning. Um, you know, they thought we were just some local blog. We were just somebody making noise. We gonna, we'd be going, we here today, going tomorrow. But um, we became a major staple in politics and, 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 and our community and, 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 and media. So, you know, just never be afraid to fail. I, I tried some stuff, it didn't work. Um, I tried a lot of things that didn't work, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, fell on my, I fell flat on my face on a lot of things, but just 
keep trying to do what you want to do. Just keep doing it. Just so I'm curious because a lot has changed. Uh, well, Black Westchester um, <coughs> joins a long line of black newspapers that have been in the forefront of the black freedom struggle, as you indicate um, in some of your remarks and discussion in the book. And um, I'm curious to know what are some of the ways, some of the experiments that you made, you and, and Damon, um, made in the area of black journalism that really distinguishes you maybe from some of your predecessors here in Westchester or, you know, nationally even? Well, if any of my English teachers are still alive and they were in this room, they would yell at me because uh, I'm told I never saw a comma that I liked and I, I talk and run on sentences as you can see and that's so I write and run on sentences and uh, I'm not always grammatically correct. I mean, you know, I might leave off a quotation or something and uh, as much as I edited this book and had it looked over, I'm quite sure you'll see that in the book. You'll see some grammatical errors. But so we, we would, but we just made sure when we gave you the information, we gave it to you raw, we gave you the facts, we backed it up with links to everything else. So people would criticize me and say, you, you know, you don't have a comma in that sentence or whatever. I was like, but did you understand the message that I, that I put out there? And they say, yes. I said, did the comma make you understand it any less? They said, no. And, and I'm not promoting bad grammar to the young people. Y'all really need to have, but, but don't let that stop you from doing what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? So, so a lot of people didn't take us serious. A lot of people um, criticized us a lot because of grammatical errors. And we just, this whole thing happened organically. And I'm glad Cynthia's here. So we started in Ju Ju June 2014. A month later, July 2014, July 2014, Eric Garner dies. Um, Damon is on some law enforcement um, convention in Ohio or something. I get a call from Cynthia Turnquest Jones. I'm like, get, get ready, I'm taking, you're coming out with me. I didn't even know where we were going. So we end up at Eric Garner's funeral. So um, there's a group called the Peacekeepers that were there and I support them. <coughs> I had Captain Dennis on our show. So I wanted to support them and I brought a t-shirt. So next, little did I know they put me to work. I'm sitting there, uh, um, you know, doing security while they bring the casket out and doing all, they, they had me working. Next thing I know, a month later, um, Michael Brown dies in Ferguson. And we wrote a couple of stories and because it was online, some people in Ferguson saw it. And while we weren't being taken serious yet in Westchester, we had a, our talk radio show, you know, they had a call in line. We get a call one day from Sharon from Ferguson. And she wanted to compliment me for getting the real story out, not what the major media was saying. And um, she called in three weeks to, to spread the word on what was really going on in Ferguson. And, and all these things just started to happen organically. Um, I'm probably far from the question you asked me. But um, in the beginning, it was just like from one thing to another, from one thing to another. Um, even when Bob Marone, when uh, Richard Thomas, I worked on the Richard Thomas campaign. So Richard Thomas approached me because there was another brother named Daryl Davis, I think he lived in Peekskill, he used to be on his show. And he moved to WVOX, you were on WFAS at the time. So Richard Thomas tells me, I got a situation for you, but it's not a situation for Black Westchester, meaning it wasn't a situation for Damon. Right, so Damon is more abrasive. Damon is going in your face. Damon is going to tell it like it is, raw, There's no chaser, right? So it's funny, so the first thing I did was call Damon and tell him, yo, they want to offer me this thing, but you know, they want to not include you. He's like, don't turn down no microphones, you go there and represent. I went, got on the show, was on his show at one day a week, talking about what was going on in Mount Vernon or whatever. Um, had a situation where I had to step back from from doing the show and ask, can my friend Damon sit in on my spot? So Damon ended up doing the show for a couple of months and then Bob calls me and goes, well, you mind if I give Damon his own day? So by keeping it real, you know, what, what was meant from Richard Thomas' aspect was meant to separate us and divide us. By us keeping it real, staying together, we both grew through it. You know what I'm saying? And Damon ended up getting his whole 
his own day and we end up growing together. And then you went from FAS to WVOX and, you know, yeah, 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 first. yeah, yeah. So, and basically that's the beginning of us. Then Damon started being on everybody's show and uh, uh, they, they offered us a day a, a month to do our own show at WVOX. So, you know, um, I forgot what your question was. Well, moment. it was about experimentation, but I think you highlighted some of the ways that Black Rochester experimented with broke from conventional models of journalism that often prevent us from starting independent outfits. And just the fact that, you know, acknowledging the role that Cynthia played um, illustrates the incorporation of um, citizen journalists who have a lot of intimate knowledge about the goings on in their communities that the larger public would benefit from, but oftentimes remain hidden and obscure because um, we may not have the professional credentials that you usually associate with journalism. I know that um, many people in the room have appeared. Brother Jeff has also, um, Brother Jeff Monroe, who's a vital partner to the Decipher program and is um, a very energetic member of the community, is another example because Jeff um, often you know, appears, he's appeared on air, I'm sure, as a guest at least once or twice and um, called in with a lot of pointed questions that try to, um, you know, force us to confront issues that um, oftentimes will go unremarked upon. Um, and that's just a few of the people that I happen to know. I want to shout out Brother Jeff. Brother Jeff is that brother that will make sure that you stay on and that you are fighting for the issue of it and you do not lose the sight of how this affects black people and, 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 and he will make sure and stay on you. Um, so shout to, shout to Brother Jeff. Yeah, so I mean I think those are some of the ways and that's another way of extending an invitation to members in the audience who may have expertise, knowledge of certain issues that afflict communities in Westchester County. Um, to consider sharing your story with us. As someone who has worked side by side with AJ, I can tell you oftentimes we bemoan the fact that there are a lot of um, important issues that are on the minds of residents of Mount Vernon and the broader Westchester community that will go unaddressed because people don't want to go on the record. There is no journalism without um, citizens, um, elected officials, others who are willing to pay, take a public stance and put their name behind, you know, their viewpoints and opinions and um, reporting. Well, we, we, like I said, there was no blueprint for this. So we made this up. We broke all the rules because we didn't know the rules. So don't never let, like, not knowing how it is, if you got it, it's, just do it. We, we just did it. Um, like he mentioned, Cynthia, several people, you see Damon and me, I'm, I'm the main editor-in-chief, I'm the main writer, I do a lot of the stuff, but you see our names on everything, but for us to be successful, there was Bob, there was, Lore there was Lorraine Lopez, there was Cynthia, there were several people that you don't see who contributed. It, it, my daughter, to be honest, I didn't even know how to use the InDesign program to design the paper. My daughter had to teach me InDesign, and she also did the cover, Paula Sherelle Woodson, she also did my cover for my book. So it, it, it's been a, it's been, it's been, a, um, it's been a lot of people who have contributed. And the reason I say that, I say two things. I don't want people to look at this as me and Damon's newspaper. This is a community paper. I want the community to look at this as our newspaper. It was never intended for it to be told in just my voice. So we always invite the residents, um, certain people, to you know, activists or whatever that, that you know, want to speak up on an issue. We created the platform. We want to allow that everybody to have access to that platform to express and expose the issues that we need to, to expose. And the other thing is, <clears throat> I just turned 56. I'm not gonna be doing this, I'm not gonna be running the press conferences another 20 years and that. Like, we have to educate the youth that wanna speak up and create and inspire the next generation of truth speakers because y'all are the future of whatever this is gonna be. Whatever the issues are, y'all are gonna be y'all gonna be ones fighting for it. And 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 in us creating this, we hope that we encourage the next generation of truth speakers and we hope that, you know, we inspire somebody out there. 
not too long, not too. My mic sounds nice, check one. Okay, okay. <clears throat> no, because Brother Jeff is um, a stickler for high quality production values, and uh -oh. I can hear him chastising me for speaking out without a mic, so I'll <coughs> speak a little louder. Not too long ago, AJ, I gave a presentation, um, and my theme, like your, the theme of your book, was faith. And, uh, Faith was focused, adaptive intelligence transformed into heroism. And I wanted to mention that because as someone who has worked closely with you and Damon and other members of Black Westchester, I am acutely aware of the heroic dimension of local journalism. Thank you, Brother Jeff. Americans, I think, are well aware of the kind of assault that our free press is under today, as we've watched um, national figures break with the kind of respect that had ordinarily been um, afforded our press, and especially under the last administration, begin to make some really shocking um, attacks on the press. And the reason I mention this is because we were also equally shocked to find ourselves in the bullseye of a local assaults on the press, on Black Westchester, especially during the last administration because of the critical um, stance that Black Westchester took with respect to the Thomas administration. We don't want to um, revisit. Well, it's in the book, so. It, but it, it is an important chapter. chapter. This, this is a book. So, so, you know, James Brown had a record called The Big Payback. I got a chapter called The Big Pushback. Um, this, to, do what you, to do this, this is not a friend-making endeavor. Um, this is not, if you're the type of person that want everybody to like you, this is not the thing for you to do. Um, everybody wants you to hold elected official feet to the fire until it's their feet or somebody they support. Everybody wants you to speak up and keep it real until you say something they don't like. Um, so you, to uncover things that people don't want uncovered, eventually they're going to start pushing back and attacking the person uncovering it. Um, and especially locally, see, when you have, when you have Lohud, um, he can do a story about Mount Vernon, and he doesn't live in Mount Vernon. They're not going to see him at Home Depot. They're not going to see him at Food Bazaar. You know, but they, they're going to see me. I walk these streets every day. They're going to see me walking down the Ave. They're going to see me every day. So, so it's, it's, you know, people think they can get up close and personal to you. <laughs> and people don't appreciate when you expose the stuff that they don't want exposed, when they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And we... Let's just say I got the scars. We survived a lot of that. It's, it's just a chapter or two of it in the book, and we got the scars to prove it. But you have to be thick-skinned. You have to stand. You know, people ask me, um, are you scared to do this? You know, you're writing about powerful people. Are you scared? And, and my answer to them, again, this has a lot to do with my faith. I know I'm not Luke Cage. I know I'm not the bulletproof brother. I know anybody can get it. But I also know that no, no man can do anything to me that God doesn't allow. And if God allows it, then he's going to be with me like Daniel in the lion's den or like the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. You know what I'm saying? So I don't walk with fear. I go out. I, I, I attack these, these situations. And, 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 and I, I stand strong. So, but um, you're going to get pushed back. You're going to get... There are people who take advantage of the community in high places. And when you expose them, you expose their way of life, you expose their, their standing, and they're not just going to go out gracefully and, you know, oh, you caught me, I'm done. They, they, they're coming for you. <laughs> so it's like we've, we've had a lot of those experiences. And you can read about them real, in great detail in the book, though. Right, and, and I think one of the factors that plays into this is that oftentimes the demand of the black community is that we have more positive press coverage of community affairs. Many of us um, feel that uh, oftentimes the, the bad, the negative aspects of 
um, happenings in our community are, are given, um, you know, are highlighted in the local media and not enough of the good stories. And, but the reality is that we're not going to be able to address the real problems that we confront and be able to forge solutions that are in keeping with the values of our community unless we're willing to have those difficult conversations. And both AJ, Damon, and other members of the staff have been in the forefront of that effort to try to highlight important issues with integrity. Um, we've had many a discussions about um, you know, editorial coverage and policy, and you know, I generally think that AJ and Damon um, together have gotten it right. Um, you know, we know a lot about maybe some of the hard-hitting stories um, that have upset people that Black Westchester have done. Um, I'm curious to know, what, did, what are some of the, proud, the stories that you're proudest of having done um, over the course of the eight years, the ones that um, not only highlight for black communities here in Westchester um, the challenges that they confront, but the, but the things that we've collectively accomplished? I mean, we will always hold people's feet to the fire. We will always do all of that. But some of the stories I'm the most proud of are probably stories that y'all have never read. For some reason, like if I write about, if someone in City Hall gets arrested today and I write all about it, I'm never gonna stop y'all from reading about it. But the little girl that was on the corner selling lemonade, she was a college student and she was literally paying her way through college selling lemonade and I did this big spotlight on her. Most people have never read that story. And there's been a lot of things where we highlighted a lot of our you know, uh, we, we try to have the balance. We got to cover the good, bad, and the ugly. You know, um, yes, the media only puts us in a bad light, but we have to, as African Americans in our community, I have to be able to call those things out. We have to, in our community, we have to be the ones to call the things out in our community. Um, so you have to do that. But we also highlight so many unsung heroes, people who have done stuff that the hell did that like I, I talked about your, your brother your brother to me was an unsung hero like you know what I mean like his other two brothers are famous they played NBA ball but he was the hero to me and he's not the one who ever got publicity and and he's done and how he touched my life he touched a lot of young people's lives like that you know what I'm saying so we try to cover those stories and, and those unsung heroes that person that's been holding it down in the community and every community has those they don't get no publicity. They nobody, you know. They don't get awards, but they do it day in and day out for the love of their community. We try to highlight those individuals, and and those are some of my proudest moments. That, that some of those stories that I covered, and seeing, you know, there was during Eric Garner. Eric Garner passed, and everybody was making a big deal, and there was some young people that wanted to have a press conference, and it was like eight of them. And they shut Mount Vernon down. <laughs> like they walked down fourth to Gramerton to the circle. The police was with them. They walked up to the to the um between the, the city hall and and, 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 and um and the police station and you know, told the police we want y'all to stop killing us and like these eight young people that were in high school or, or early college, nobody else came out to cover them. You know what I'm saying? Like I covered that story. And we have to keep covering those kind of stories. That's, that's, that's some of the stuff I'm most proud of that, that we've done. Okay, well I see that uh, time is moving forward and I would like to extend an opportunity to members of the audience to um, ask questions, comments um, for AJ um, in the last remaining 15 minutes or so. Um, are there questions? And if you have questions, I'd be happy. Um, please go to the mic. Um, the mic. Yes, go to the mic, please, so <laughs> that we can be sure to record it. Um, so you know this um, event is being filmed, and we will post it to our um, YouTube page and also distribute it um, via Facebook. My good friend Bob Marone, who also never saw a microphone he didn't like. So. <laughs> <laughs> AJ, interesting what you said before. Um, I actually was in the middle of 
preparing a, uh, a, a review of the book. And what I find, and I'm sure, where's the lady that was sitting next to me? Because she had to think the same thing. You could have had that book go out for copy edit. And you would have fixed the odd comma and the, and the, and the quotes. Did you not do it on purpose? Because I have to tell you, one of the charms of the book is it is as honest as he says. It is as real as you are. It's, it's almost in that way perfect. And because of the way you built the magazine, uh, which is really now a news source, because of the, the way you built it, it, the fact that it had those, and they have to be mentioned in a review, the missing comma, the missing period, the, maybe it was a subject verb agreement here and there, not right. It added to the charm of the book and its reality. So what I want to know is, did you do that purposeful to not copy edit? You could have given it to this, this woman journalist back here, and she could have just put a comb over it. But it wouldn't have been you in some ways. I'm embarrassed to say I edited that book over and over <laughs> myself. Um, okay. No, well, you but, know, but you, and you, you can't edit yourself. because well, We all know you can't miss. edit yourself. No, I'm no, terrible no, at it. Yeah, yeah, you can't edit yourself. Um, one of the things, I don't know if I did it on purpose. I actually tried to get a lot of that cleaned up. Oh, sure you and, did. And, That's the way it works. And, and, with Amazon, once you see some errors, you can actually fix them and then send it back in, and sure. everybody else who buys the book, those errors won't be in it. So, but, you know, one guy I used to work with, Damon, he's retired at, at Valhalla, he said the, what he loved about Black Westchester is it was raw. It was raw, yeah, and, 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 and I think, you know, especially with a lot of young people here, you know, there's always stuff on being perfect. You can't do it until it's perfect. I mean, I've learned a lot in eight years, and my work has gotten a lot better in eight years, so let's just say I'm always I'm no, working. But, but, but please, but, don't but, even be embarrassed by it. Right, it, right. It, but it, it, I just want to say, the, not being perfect, bell. yeah, not being perfect, you don't have to be perfect right. to speak up and to make a difference. And what you said before about the comm is true. It was absolutely clear what you wrote. It was very good reading, very easy reading, and, and uh, you know, I lived through a lot of that with you. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely on the money. And, I, and, and the other second part of my question is, I've known you about all eight, eight years, nine years, something like that. It's gone, been a right. while now. You've never, I've never seen you in a bad mood. You've never treated anyone who you disagreed with disrespectfully. How in God's name I, do I you keep your mood? I have family members here that are shaking their head no, like you must. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm putting the mic down. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> I, you know what? I, you know what? I, I do. There are times my brother Noel has seen me. Uh, Lose it a few times. Um, but you know what? You can't, I learned something. You can't let, I actually learned this from one of my pastors in, 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 um, in Georgia. When people get under your skin, sometimes you cannot let it show at that moment that they got under your skin. Some people will do some things just to get under your skin because they know they can get under your skin. So sometimes you got to not let it show. You need to go back and regroup and then handle it a certain way that you need to handle it. So, so I say that. But no, I um, uh, Cynthia can tell you a few people in this room. I, I I lose it. I do. I do lose I, it. I, it's hard to believe, but I'm sure you do. But anyway, well, I've, seen it. <laughs> I, I've been I've been here enough. But the the book is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. you, you thank you, it, for your you support. You hit it right on the nose. And thank you for your time for coming. I appreciate. Oh, it. you kidding? I, I had to go to get a little bit of surgery, so I ran late on my eye. Hey, AJ. Hey. So um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, including me in Black Westchester and People Before Politics. Um, so that when, when, when I, I'm an active, I'm, I am an activist. I am an active activist. And so when uh, Eric Gardner passed away, the activists, we have a channel and we know where to go. We know when there are... Um, uh, when we have to go to court or if we have to go to um, support the family. And so I call AJ because AJ wasn't doing anything that day, right? So I was like, yo, AJ, I need you to come with me and do something real quick. I didn't tell him what he was doing at all. And so we get to Brooklyn and I was like, listen, you're going to have to start carrying a casket in like a few minutes. And he was like, what? I That's said, an exaggeration. Yeah. I actually so, did not carry like, Eric Gardner's casket. Put the, put the shirt on. Put the shirt on, AJ, <laughs> and go over there and start carrying uh, Eric Gardner's casket. And he's like, "What?" I was like, "Yeah, just go over there." But um, so it was many different 
uh, boots to the ground uh, situations that AJ and I were in. But one, one of the things that you did not mention is that there, um, on, on the show People Before Politics, there were you know, many different um, topics that we had. And we had the Honorable Hafiz Muhammad, oh, who, uh, who was the, the, the student minister under the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And we had Muslims come through. And one in particular name is um, Rashad Bilal. So Rashad Bilal, right now, is at Tyler Perry house. He's at the studio right now as we speak. Y'all know him because, from Earn Your Leisure. Because he started Earn Your Leisure after being on People Before Politics once a month and giving information about money. And so then they took it to another level. And so right now they are at that other level because Tyler Absolutely. Perry asked him to come to the house so we can sit down and talk about how we are going to teach our black brothers and black sisters about the power of money. And so I just wanted to make sure that you also remember that, that uh, Rashad came out of Peel Before Politics. He's in, he's in the book. He definitely mentioned And it. the last thing that I want to share is that I, um, chapter books, there is always an error in every single chapter book that have been looked over, over and over, and over and over again. And I tell you that as today is my last day, I will be graduating from Long Island University with library science. And so before, before I said, AJ, I said, AJ, I'm coming and when I come there, I will not own or owe another paper and so that's one of the things that I learned while studying to become a librarian is that don't worry about the errors. Once the message get through, it's black power. Thank you, AJ. I want to, I also want to give Cynthia a shout out. Cynthia will be at an event and she'll take some pictures and she'll tell me something. I'll be like, oh, that'll be a great article. And she's, she's, she always gets that, so she gets encouraged to write a lot of articles. She gets, you know, uh, from being out and about, she's covered a lot of events. And I'd be like, yo, can I get a, a certain amount of words on that by Friday? And so sometimes she hates to see my phone, <laughs> my number on her phone, so yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Um I actually come from the other side of business from you, which is like media relations, public right. relations. So I, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your publication here. Yes, yes, yes. I would say goodbye to somebody, yes. For, I want to congratulate you on your publication. It's very much needed. I spent most of the 80s and 90s working on the opposite side of you in terms of media relations. And I found, we found, I found you know, black newspapers to be you know, late to the show, you know, um, afraid, uninformative, and so on and so on. As a matter of fact, there was a small newspaper you probably heard of called the, um, the City Sun. Yes, yes. yes. It was just kind of like, you know, progenitor to you. By the way, when you worked at The Source, were you at 596 Broadway or Union Square? I actually was down with Dave Mays when he was a Harvard student, when okay. he was a front page, and, I, and I've been with them the whole time. Like, yeah, know. my office was, as you, when you came to, the, came to The Source, you walked out of the Elevator, I was right in front of the elevator. Oh, okay. So maze is down the hall for me. But the city sun, so for instance, this little newspaper in Brooklyn was the most feared newspaper in the country from my side of the business, for instance, from the film business or from Eddie Murphy's, Eddie Murphy's uh, situation. There's a writer named Armand White yes. who literally, the small black newspaper, literally every studio feared him because they wanted to make sure he gave their black movie a great review. You know, so there's power in what you do. Um, you know, it's very much needed. From out my work, you know, whether it was the LA Examiner, Chicago Defender, no. those things were irrelevant because you know, they didn't really have a real voice. If your voice represents the black community the way you do in terms of putting fear into the politicians, that's the power. It's not 
printing someone's press release that they sent to you with an ad for a cigarette company. Right. You know, right. that those newspapers lived off ads in terms of things that were like devastating to the black community. Yeah. Cigarettes, fast food, you know, crazy stuff. So it's really important that the, the job that you are fulfilling be fearless. Also in terms of writing, when I teach writing, grammar, none of that things means anything. One of the problems with black people writing is they try to take this other voice. Yes. You know, so it becomes a situation where they're talking in another voice. The thing to do is speak in your voice, yes. write in your voice. Your writing should sound like you speak. Anything else is inauthentic. Thank you. Yeah. And, and right. just what you didn't know, one of the people who inspired me to write professionally was Harry Allen, okay. who um, is the first person who ever mentioned my group. And my first thing that was mentioned in my group was Harry Allen in the, in the City Sun. I know Harry. Yeah, I know him too. When I was doing him. Yes. Yeah. So, AJ, yes, sir. Uh, we, we just wanted to thank you first and foremost to, to say the, the value that Black Westchester has, right, is... Like you said, it, there, there was nobody else telling our stories from our perspective, from our, that's the void that's been filled there. And I think really, we kind of think of Black Westchester as Black Mount Vernon, like it's the whole county, but it's, yes, it's yes. like we, we're, we're here. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to the one of the points you made is that a lot of times in the whole journalism, journal, excuse me, journalism industry, if it bleeds, it leads. And so we focus yes. a lot on a lot of these negative things. That's not to say they shouldn't be there, because yeah. that's part of news and that's what we need to talk about. But there was an article that was in Black Westchester a few months ago, written by uh, Miss Barrios. Uh, Olivia. Who, yes. Yeah, Olivia Barrios, about the, the closing, you know, last few months here of the, the renovations and the construction on Memorial Field. When a lot of people weren't writing about Memorial Field, about what we've done, they're writing about it in terms of all of the problems that it had, which again is important, but to say that let's talk about what we're actually accomplishing here in this community as well. And so I guess my question is, as, as somebody who's you know, serving that need here for, for Westchester and for Mount Vernon specifically, and especially with all these young kids here, what can we do as our community to make sure that Black Westchester stays here forever, telling these stories, telling all of what we do? How can we support you as a community to make sure that you can keep your doors open? And whether it's you or whether you want to hand that off to somebody else, you say you don't want to do these press conferences forever. What do we need to do to keep Black Westchester here? And how can any of these young people in the room do what Olivia Barrios did and contribute to Black Westchester and start their own journalism careers if that's something that they want to do. Uh, Olivia, shout out to Olivia. She's not here. She's out of town with her mother. Um, uh, she's a Zeta something. They're having a big Zeta thing or whatever. She's 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 she's, 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 she's in the theater. Right, right. So yeah. she's she's there. Yeah, yeah, she's there now with her mother. But <laughs> ironically, that was and and uh, Damaris, Damaris, um, and. Mm -hmm. um, she lived next door to uh, Brenda L. Crump, who uh, is a very big contributor. And she's, uh, uh, she's going to be a junior now in Quinnipiac University. She needed an internship. So Gre Brenda basically told her to call me. But we, we're trying to do more of, the, of internship and, 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 and stuff like that. And, you know, anybody who's interested. And let me just say this to the young people. Your voice is very important. I am 54. I like to think I'm young at heart but I'm no longer the youth. So I can't speak for the youth. Y'all have to speak for yourselves. And I often give young people that opportunity, if you want to, write what is affecting, what, what do you want the people to know that affects y'all? You know what I'm saying? Because it is affecting y'all. And y'all are the future of what this is. As far as um, the, the first part, we didn't, because we push a lot of buttons, there are some people that who will never advertise with us um, because who, who have money. But um, shout, uh, the, Mr. Uh, George Latimer just left. The county, you know, took out like six months worth of ads on our back page. What, what's kept us going is people believing in us. You don't know there's several times people walk up. I don't have nothing to advertise. I just want to keep y'all. I want to keep y'all going and just make a donation or something like that. Like those donations have been huge to keep us going. Um, but we live on advertising, and we wanted to make it free for the people because in 2014, I, I had a long meeting with Ernie Davis, who was the mayor at the time, in August 2014. And I was like, the, commun the, the elected officials are benefiting on the community being uninformed and often misinformed. You know what I'm saying? So 
So, and when y'all put the word out, it doesn't trickle down. I live on South 7th Avenue. So I live in the hood. You know what I'm saying? The, the information does not trickle down to my block. No matter what happens, it, it, it never trickles down. So we wanted to keep it free for the people. I don't sell it for a quarter or 50 cent or a dollar. If I did, people who need the information would never get it. So we fight to be free, independent media. And, you know, advertisers pay for it. And, and donations, a lot of donations have gotten us through from people who just believe in us. AJ, I've only known AJ for a very a short period of time. He, um, last year is when I first met him, and I'd like to uh, thank him for this beautiful struggle in writing this book and the life that you've lived and the faith that you've uh, shared with us that kept you getting up in the face of adversity. And so oftentimes there are so many stories that are just totally left out of the, the narrative of black lives. And that's the thing that we're facing now. That's all the conversation and all the um, controversy about the critical race theory. And it's all about the history that was omitted. And so I look at Black Westchester as a media for telling these stories. And it applies to um, all of Westchester County. It's just not black folks only. And so I appreciate this pointed truth narrative of telling these stories in their best form of just being truthful to, to the story. And so thank you. And AJ would always send me, mail a copy up to Bedford, and that, those newspapers really meant a lot to me because I'm getting a narrative in Northern Westchester of, you know, say, the, the Times, one of the Times, and it is not the complete story. And as someone who's trying to represent and be a part of doing good in our community, I'd like to see the entire stories being told. And you've done that. Thank you, thank you. I, I, before we um, wrap a story that um, you recount in the book that really does um, illustrate the point that Ms. Carr was making. Yes. And that is um, the story that you did on- Freddie Gray? Freddie Gray. Yes, and why don't you share that a little bit? So, so real short, so real, as my favorite quote from Denzel Washington, to make a long story longer, <laughs> but um, to try to make this short as possible. Um, we, again, Cynthia mentioned we, in, we are in tune with the activists. So several of the activists from here were going down to Baltimore to support the brothers and sisters there. So one of our brothers, Frank Francois, Frank Shaw Francois, he was on stage with the, the activists. They did this big thing. 10,000 black people peacefully protested. And he took the picture from the stage, and I covered this. Um, 100 people acted a fool. 34 people got arrested. The media talked about thousands and thousands of black people acting a fool. And only covered the 34 who got arrested, but nobody talked about the 10,000 that peacefully protested. So I got pissed off and I called out the media. The New York Times, I put their headline in. USA Today, I put their headline up. And all the media, and I called them out. And it's, it's amazing, it was crazy about it. I called them out and told them that their sensational headlines is going to be the match that burns down Baltimore. Two days later is when they had that big fire at the CBS and all of that. And I said, nobody wanted to see a thousands and thousands of black people truly act up. You know what I'm saying? But they, they only show. So that was one of the, so that was my first story that actually went viral. 1.7 million people read it in the first 36 hours. And people like Chuck D and Talib Kweli were tweeting it and everybody was tweeting it. It was just, I've never been able to recapture that, those kind of numbers. <laughs> but uh, that was like my first big story that went viral. So, so I'm going to say, um, to your question, Eric, ways that people can support Black Westchester. Um, you know, news outfits that are dependent on ad revenue are increasingly going into extinction. This is a real challenge that all newspaper outfits are um, confronting, even um, the major news outlets. So for those of you who are entrepreneurs, business persons who serve Westchester County, please do consider taking out an ad. Um, in Black Westchester. 
For those of you who are news readers, please consider taking out a subscription. Black Westchester is free, though, and AJ and Damon want um, maximum readership. And one way that ordinary readers can help support the paper is to share stories on Facebook and on other major social media. As you know, this is one of the ways that you can demonstrate to would-be advertisers the extent of your reach. And so it's important for people to share those stories that they like um, on, on media. And, and finally, this is a voice for the community. I can tell you, AJ welcomes contributions from ordinary <laughs> citizen journalists just like himself. He will you know, attest that he hasn't had a whole lot of formal training, um, but more importantly, he's had the passion and commitment, and that's the main criteria for journalism, and so um, we welcome contributions from others. Um, if there are no questions, we don't want to be inconsiderate of the um, library staff. Um, we have refreshments. Um, we have refreshments. And let me, um, as she floats past us, let me give a special thanks and shout out, everyone, to Kathy Webb. She is the heart of this library. Yes. And has been for decades. She keeps this library running. Yes. And that's why she went behind me while I said that. She, she, and she doesn't do it for the publicity, and she doesn't do it for camera, for photo ops, none of that. So shout out. And I also have my books in the back um, uh, if anybody wants to purchase yes. it. So at this point, I'd like to extend everyone um, you know, an opportunity to go indulge in some refreshments. Um, for those of you who are interested in purchasing a book, AJ will be in the back.